the Crusades. There is perhaps no event in history that has created more controversy, more hard feelings, more frustration than the Crusades. A series of quotes, David Hume, an 18th century Scottish philosopher, one of my heroes, uh, I started in philosophy before I got into theology. David Hume, an epistemologist, said the Crusades were, and I quote, the most signal and durable monument to human folly that has yet appeared in any nation or age. Dave, uh, Denis Diderot, who is a French philosopher, he's one of the, the writers of the Encyclopedia, a French effort to try to accumulate all of human knowledge. He wrote the Crusades were, quote, a time of deepest darkness and of the greatest folly to drag a significant part of the world into an unhappy little country in order to cut the inhabitants' throats and seize a rocky peak which was not worth one drop of blood. More recently, the New York Times in 1999 said the Crusades are comparable to Hitler's atrocities or the ethnic cleansing of Kosovo. And Bill Clinton in 2011 said those of us who come from various European lineages are not blameless regarding the Crusades as a crime against Islam. In 1999, to mark the 900th anniversary of the Crusaders' conquest of Jerusalem, a group of Protestant, what they call themselves reconciliation walkers, walked from Germany to the Holy Land, believe it or not, and they wore t-shirts along the way which in Arabic read, I apologize. And this was from their official statement. They said, 900 years ago, our forefathers carried the name of Jesus Christ in battle across the Middle East. Fueled by fear, greed, and hatred, the Crusaders lifted the banner of the cross above up your people. On the anniversary of the First Crusade, we wish to retrace the footsteps of the Crusaders in apology for their deeds. We deeply regret the atrocities committed in the name of Christ by our predecessors. We renounce greed, hatred, and fear, and condemn all violence in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, to sum all this up, there is a prevailing wisdom that the Crusades were all about an expansionist, imperialistic Christianity that um, traveled to the Middle East and brutalized, looted, and colonized a tolerant and peaceful Islam. Um, there's only one problem with all that. It simply is not true. <laughs> and I want to talk about that. So what are we talking about when we, when we discuss the Crusades? Here's a definition, my definition. <laughs> um, in the 11th century AD, Islamic forces of the Muslim Seljuk Turks defeated armies of the Christian Byzantine Empire, cut off Christian access to holy sites in and around Jerusalem, and threatened to overrun all of Asia Minor and through the Iberian Peninsula into Western Europe. In response to this, and to pleas for help from the Eastern Emperor in Constantinople, Christian Western Europeans launched almost two centuries of military campaigns to free the Holy Land from Muslim control. So this, I believe, is a definition of what the Crusades were. Historically, they were very important, but I believe they are probably the most misunderstood time period in history. And while I'm giving you my sense of this, I'm not the only one who believes this. There has been more and more historian come out and say, you know, this this painting all of the Crusades with a black brush against the Europeans simply is not realistic given the history of the time. Um, we continue to have upheavals because of this. When George W. Bush, after 9-11, he, he publicly said that they were going to launch a crusade against terrorism. The very fact that he used the word crusade created an international furor because it brought back the idea of uh, Westerners marching into the Middle East for uh, warlike purposes. So the word crusade comes from a French word which means literally to take up the cross. In fact, in the medieval time, well in the, the 11th, 12th centuries, 13th century when the crusades were occurring, uh, they would talk about, they, uh, a, a knight would say he was going to take up the cross and that meant he was going to go on crusade. But as fascinating as all this is, we need to be honest and realistic when we look at the history and have some sense of what motivated all this. I would say right up front, there were horrible things done by both sides. Do not misunderstand me. The Crusades were a time of horrendous um, militant atrocities. 
by both <coughs> Europeans and some of the uh, the people who lived in the Middle East. And let's not let's not hide that, but let's be fair about what the motivations were. A couple of maps that I've shown you already that I think give you a, a perspective on what the cause of the Crusades were. And I'm going to talk about a number of different causes. This is a map I've shown you from 565 AD. This was during the time of the sort of revival of the Byzantine Christian Empire uh, based in Constantinople under Justinian and his wife um, uh, Theodora. The, the green line outlines the Byzantine Christian Byzantine Empire, but all of these yellow areas up here, all of this is where Christianity existed as the dominant faith at this point. Not because uh, up till this point there had been no efforts to force anybody into the Christian faith. There had not been any military campaigns that tried to require people to become Christians. The first time we really run into that is in the ninth century under Charlemagne. Charlemagne got pretty rough with some of the people who lived in Western Europe, some of the tribes, and forcing them into Christianity. But up to this point, it had been entirely voluntary. So don't so just so you're clear on that. The Franks, the Visigoths, a lot of the various barbarian peoples who had been pagans and who had been responsible for sacking Rome and doing and creating the Dark Ages in Western Europe voluntarily later on became Christians. And so this was the extent of the Christian faith. We've talked about this map as well. This is the growth of Islam uh, under first Muhammad, the dark orange, then under the first four caliphs or successors, the Rashidun caliphs, and then the pink is under the Umayyad um, uh, caliphate, the next caliphate following. And as we talked about, they crossed through the Maghreb, which is the northwestern part of Africa. They crossed at here and under the uh, Umayyads. They took over all of the Iberian Peninsula, that is Spain and Portugal, all the way up into Western Europe and were stopped at Tours in 732 by Charlemagne's grandfather, uh, Charles Martel. Uh, their desire, their goal, had been to continue conquering through Western Europe. At the same time, here, they had, they had had various sorties all the way over into the Byzantine Empire. This is the Byzantine Empire, which is uh, the Eastern Roman Christian Empire. They had not conquered Asia Minor, what we know of as Turkey yet, but they had sorties all the way up to Constantinople. This is Constantinople, which was the head of the Christian Byzantine Empire at that point. They had gotten over into Afghanistan, um, Pakistan as we know it now, India. That's why a lot of those countries, including Iran, Iraq, etc., have been Islamic since fairly early on. But you can see that all of these areas, I want to put these, uh, this is the, the uh, greatest extent of the Arab Islamic uh, Empire, all the way over into um, to the Indus River, up into uh, the Iberian Peninsula, all of North Africa. So I want to put these two maps up together. North Africa had been a major center for Christianity. Uh, it, you've heard of Augustine, St. Augustine. In the 400s, he was probably the most, and he's one of the most important Christian theologians in history. He was the Bishop of Hippo in what we know of as Libya in North Africa. All of North Africa was Christian. Um, and all well over into Armenia, etc. So compare that Christian map to this Islamic map. Do you begin to see why Christian Europe had real concerns? Islam had declared their intent, and they they did conquer by force of arms. They did not force people to convert to Muslim Islam. Let me make sure you're clear on that. It has been very rare in the history of Islam where they required people to convert to Islam. But they did conquer the lands and take control by force of arms. They then had a tax on anyone who was not Muslim, and there were other limitations on non-Muslims. They actually were quite generous. For instance, when they controlled the uh, Al-Andalusia Al here, they were very generous toward Jews and Gentiles. Um, Jews and Catholics, Christians, but still, you know, they controlled it by force of arms, and their desire was to continue invading both in the West and in the East. Um, and Christian Europe, for hundreds of years, had the fear that they were going to be overwhelmed by Muslim armies. 
In 1054, there is the Great Schism, which separates uh, Eastern Christianity in the yellow from Western Christianity in the green. Uh, Western Christianity, with its center in Rome, was what we know of today as Roman Catholicism. Um, Rome was the patriarchy, if you will. The Bishop of Rome was the head of that church. In the Eastern side, it was the Greek Byzantine Christian Empire. Now, these before the schism in 1054, there was a lot of differences between them already. In Europe, um, they spoke Latin. They had a different rite or uh, order of service. In the East, they spoke Greek. And there was a focus on things like uh, icons, things that they did not use in Western. There, there were very different kinds of theologies in many ways. There was a focus of the, the Roman Catholic priests could not marry. In the East, the, the uh, priests in the Orthodox faiths not only were, could marry, but they were encouraged to marry. There were a lot of other differences. One side said you, you should use leavened bread in, the, in communion. The other side said no, it had to be unleavened bread, and that was a big deal. One of the final straws before this split is a little item which in Latin is called the filioque. Are you familiar with it? The Nicene Creed. If you've ever been to church, churches all over the world use the Nicene Creed. It is the most common creed. It was written at the Council of Nicaea, the first great church council in the 300s in Nicaea, which is near Constantinople. It's over here, okay, right in there. Well, it was written in Greek by the Eastern Church. The Western Church really liked it and they adopted it and translated it into Latin. But one of the things that the Creed said was, we believe in the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe that Jesus Christ is only Son, our Lord, etc., etc. Comes down to the Holy Spirit, it says we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. That's what the Greeks wrote. When it came over to the Latins in the West, they added a phrase. They said, who proceeds from the Father, and the Son, filioque in Latin, and the Son. When they got back to the Eastern Greek Christians that they had rewritten their creed and they didn't believe theologically that was accurate, all heck broke, broke loose, all right? And in 1054, the reason that's when the schism occurred is the Pope in Rome had sent representatives to Constantinople um, to try to convince them to accept the Pope as the head of the church. Well, there was a head of the church in Constantinople, too, the Patriarch of Constantinople. Originally, there were five great patriarchies in Christianity. They were Alexandria in Egypt, Jerusalem in Israel, Antioch in Syria, the Constantinople, and Rome. Well, what happened to the first three? Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Antioch were all controlled by Muslims. Islam took over all of those. They're all down here, okay? Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch. They were taken over by Islam. That left two major centers of Christianity, Constantinople and Rome. They spoke different languages, and over a period of time, each of them thought they should be in charge, that they were the center of the church. Well, in 1054, when the Pope from Rome sent representatives to Constantinople, right in the middle of a service in the Hagia Sophia, the cardinal that he had sent walked up to the altar and slapped letters of excommunication down against the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Emperor. Apparently they were kind of gruff ambassadors. They were not very diplomatic. So right in the middle of the service, he excommunicates the religious head and the governmental head of the Eastern Empire. Well, the Patriarch of Constantinople turns around and excommunicates the Pope. Everybody's excommunicating everybody. And in those days, that was a big deal. That meant eternal damnation, quite literally. So we end up with this big split, all right? And the two sides were not communicating with one another. Prior to this, only about 45 years before this, they had had a problem. Uh, if you can see, uh, it doesn't even say it down here. You will remember when I talked about Islam. I'm sure you remember everything I said about Islam. <laughs> this is about the time when in Egypt there was a caliphate, the Fatimid Caliphate. And that was the only Shiite caliphate that ever existed other than two years that Ali was one of the Rashidun Caliphs. So the difference in Shiite and Sunni, the only time the Shiites have been in charge. Well, unfortunately in 1009, the new Fatimid Caliph that came on board was named Al-Hakim. He came to be known as the Mad Caliph. 
because unlike all of his predecessors, he decided that he wanted to destroy all of the Christian sites that were in the Holy Land, which was controlled. This is all controlled by Islam down here now. He wanted to destroy the Tomb of the Holy Sepulcher, which he did. It was later rebuilt, but he destroyed the original one. Um, he started having Christian pilgrims attacked. Prior to that, the Muslims had allowed Christians to visit the Holy Land and visit the various locations. Um, the rest of Islam did not agree with him. And in fact, they gave permission, the rest of the Islamic world, other than the Fatimid Caliph uh, al-Hakim, gave permission to the Byzantine Empire, centered in Constantinople, to provide protection to Christian pilgrims who were going to that part of the world. And so they began to provide protection, and they got involved militarily at the request of other Muslims in this time. Well, this continued. The Seljuk Turks come in. They take over all of this area over here. They grow in power. The, um, the Byzantine Empire is shrinking. And then there's the huge split in 1054 between Eastern and Western Christianity. Did you guys know all this already? Am I telling you something you already knew? So the Seljuk Turk Empire, they had defeated other um, Muslims in Dandanakan. The, the Turks had come from Turkmenistan. Originally, they were mercenaries fighting on behalf of the Turkish, the uh, Muslim powers in here. And they finally, when they said, wait a minute, we're fighting all the battles. We're stronger than they are. Why are we doing what they say? So they, they defeated the other Muslim armies in Dandanakan, and then they defeated the Byzantine army at Manzikirk in 1071. This is just a few years after 1054 when the East and West had split. So there's no longer a unified Christian West. And they had taken over all the way up to here. That's where Constantinople is, right there. This side was Christian, this side is now Muslim. Have you been to Constantinople? Yes. Okay, Constantinople is the only city in the world that is on two continents. It is both in Europe and it's in Asia. <coughs> The walls had been, there had been, they built phenomenal walls around Constantinople, and when the Seljuk Turks took over all of Asia Minor, they were right up to the walls. So, in 1095, the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church, was having a church council, the Council of Clermont in France. And in November of that year, the Byzantine Empire sends out a plea to the West, to the most powerful person in the West, who happened to be the Pope, Pope Urban II. He sent a plea to the Pope during the church council and said, Help! We've got Muslim armies right outside the gates. They intend to destroy our city, and what they do, they're going to continue taking over Europe. Well, they still had Muslim armies. They had been pushed back in the 700s from France, but they were still in Spain and Portugal. So they had Muslim armies that were controlling and wanted to do more controlling of the Western Europe. They had Muslim armies getting ready to enter Eastern Europe through Constantinople. So when the Byzantine emperor sent out word to Pope Urban II at this church council, he declares, he calls for a crusade to fight back against the Muslim armies that threatened to take over Christendom. Christendom is not a word we use often anymore. It meant the land that Christianity was the dominant faith in. Christendom meant where Christianity was. And so he sent out this request, the, the emperor did, and the pope responded. In fact, Pope Urban said, Deus volt, God wills it, that we should respond to this need and to prevent Christianity from being driven out of all of Europe. That's sort of how I got started. So what are the reasons for the Crusades? One, it was a response by Western Christianity, that is based in Rome, to the plea from Eastern Christianity, the Byzantine emperor, to help him when he was being assaulted by Muslim armies. Second, it was to defend Christian Europe against further Muslim invasion. Again, you can look at the maps. On the west and on the east, there was a threat from Muslim armies. The hopes of reuni uh, reuniting the two halves of Christ Christendom. The situation was so bad in Istanbul that the emperor and the patriarch said, if you will come and help us, we will become Catholics. 
We will acknowledge the Pope in Rome as being the head of the church. We will, you know, we, we won't try to demand that we're the top dog or anything else anymore. We'll, you know, you help us and we'll do what, pretty much whatever you want. And so there had been a desire for a long time, many, many, many years at that point, to try to reunite the two halves of Christendom. To establish the authority of Pope Urban II as a leader of Christianity, now, some of this may have been pride, but some of it may have been Pope Urban believing this is the right thing to do. You know, that, that there needs to be one leader in Christianity, and he thought it should be him, obviously, or there wouldn't have been this question all along. Then, to defend Christian holy sites and pilgrims. Remember, the Mad Caliph al-Hakim from the Fatimids had been attacking pilgrims, had been destroying Christian sites, and even though the Byzantine armies were beginning to try to protect them, most of the area in between the Byzantines, Constantinople, and the Holy Land was now controlled by the Seljuk Turks. It wasn't like they could just drive over there and help protect people. So there was an issue. To focus energies of Western Knights away from internal fighting. How many of you all have been in the military? Okay. Have you ever painted all the rocks surrounding a parking lot white and then been told to go back and paint them all white again? <laughs> Have you ever had a situation where there was a pile of dirt and they said, we want you to move that over here, and then when you did, they said, okay, now move it back? Have you ever had that? Most usually people say, yeah. Well, the reason is, if you have a standing army, the biggest problem you have is what do you do with them when you don't have a war to fight, when you don't have an enemy? You train people to fight battles, and then you tell them to just sit around because we don't have anybody to fight right now, and, and they often get in trouble. That's true throughout history. Well, one of the problems with the Western Knights, they were trained as, as fighters. They were warriors. And they didn't have anybody to fight at that point. And they, were, they had a natural tendency to turn on each other. They'd fight each other. Not only that, they'd pick on other people. This was a time in history when the church passed two rules, one called the truce of God and one called the peace of God. One of them said, here's a list of people you can't beat up. You can't beat up monks or priests or women or children or peasants, okay? That was the peace of God. The truce of God, and, and on, on penalty of excommunication, if you do that, the truce of God said, you, here are the days that you can't fight on. You can't fight on Sunday or feast days or holy days or whatever. And so they were always struggling to try to figure out how to keep a lid on this. All of a sudden, they had what looked like a very legitimate enemy that needed to be fought against, and that would give the Western Knights, the armies, something to do. Then there was a belief in the imminent second coming of Christ, which it was believed required that Jerusalem be back in Christian hands. Um, there's nothing in Scripture about this. I don't know who made that up, but it became a popular belief. that you know A lot of people had thought, remember we're in the 11th century, it's just after the turn of the millennium. The church had been waiting for Jesus' return, which is a basic doctrine of Christianity, for a thousand years. As they approached the 1,000 mark, everybody assumed he was going to come back at the millennium. Well, he didn't. Here we are 50-some years later, almost 60 years later, and everybody thought, well, there must be some reason he hasn't been back yet. Ah, I know. We Christians need to have control of the Holy Land. And because we are not in control of the Temple Mount and the other holy sites, then that's why he hasn't returned yet. There unfortunately also developed a horrendous belief that all Jews needed to have converted to Christianity before he would return, and if they didn't convert, then they needed to be dead or he wouldn't come back. Unbelievable. And yet, that was something that was believed back then. And finally, for a very, very few, there was the potential of adventure and gain. Now, I say a very few. Most people think that's the whole reason we did it, that the Crusaders were just a bunch of drunken frat boys that wanted to beat people up, and so they went to the Holy Land to do it. We now have documented evidence that most of the people who went on crusade gave everything up to do so. Imagine if you lived in France or Germany or Britain, and you were asked to go to the Holy Land by horse. And you had to have multiple horses and gear and weapons and somebody to take care of those and foodstuffs. You had to have arrangements made for you along the way. It's a long journey. This was a horrendously uh, expensive undertaking. 
Most of the people who went on crusade either sold or mortgaged everything they had to do this. It was not a matter that they went there thinking that they were going to get rich. They gave up everything in order to, to travel there and to fight what they thought was a holy war. So the idea that everybody went there in order to try to get money or property or whatever, we now have evidence that that wasn't true, that it was horrendously expensive for them. Well, the first, when Pope Urban declared that we were going to have in, in 1095, that he wanted to have a crusade, he said it should, they should leave, the crusaders should get together and they should leave in August of 1096. Well, he expected about a thousand people to show up. The first thing that happened, well, because this was a church council and all the priests and monks and whatnot of the church were all together, he preached this and said, Deus vult, God wills it that we respond. All of these monks and priests went back to their homes and their villages and their churches and started preaching the, uh, the need for us to have a crusade to protect Christianity from Muslim armies. In 1096, which was earlier than they were supposed to anyway, a terrible thing happens. Um, under the leadership of a guy named Peter the Hermit of Amiens in France, he started calling for, for people, not warriors, not knights, just people, peasants, to get together and go to the Holy Land. And we have the first, which is an unofficial crusade, it's not, it's not part of the list of official crusades, but it was the first time people started out, the Peasants' Crusade or the People's Crusade in, in April of 1096. 40,000 mostly unskilled fighters left, the, as they walked through Europe, they gathered up more and more people, none of them ready to fight, none of them with weapons, and they, they travel, and as they traveled along, they, they sacked towns, they persecuted Jewish people along the way. It was a horrendous problem. They, go, they march all the way across Europe, refusing to listen to all of the pleas by the Pope and everybody else not to do this. They get to Constantinople, and the emperor in Constantinople says, what am I supposed to do with you lot of losers? <laughs> And they said, just give us boats to get across the, you know, the Bosporus or Dardanelles, the Bosporus actually, and we'll take care of the rest. And he went, fine, I don't want to have to feed you, so go. They crossed over in borrowed boats, and they were shortly massacred by Muslims outside of the city of Nicaea, or the Nicene Council, very short distance from Constantinople. A horrendous start. But none of that was part of an official crusade. The first official crusade actually got started a little late. Instead of August of, of 1096, they left in December of 1096, mostly French and Italians, about 100,000 of them. Now remember, the Pope expected 1,000. 100,000 people, most of, many of them knights, a lot of them support staff, because you had to have people to take care of the horses and polish your armor and all that kind of stuff. They left out, they traveled east, the, the uh, emperor in Constantinople said, finally, someone that can help. So he took them across, gave them supplies. They traveled across Asia Minor. They besieged the city of Antioch. They conquered Jerusalem in July of 1099. And they set up four crusader states, principalities, if you will. They were called the County of Edessa, the County of Tripoli, the Principality of Antioch, and the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Um, this was the route that various groups took, and they met up in Constantinople, and then they traveled down here, and they took took uh, control of Jerusalem. They conquered Jerusalem in 1099. They had conquered uh, Antioch the year before. They created the County of Edessa, which was a private principality with its own king, the Principality of Antioch, the County of Tripoli, and the Kingdom of Jerusalem. This Principality of Armenia had existed before. It was a Christian principality, and they, the these areas were taken and given back to the emperor of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, in fact, his, he gave them supplies on the promise that whatever they conquered, that he had, had been part of his empire before they gave it back to him. And so they gave some of this land back, but they set up these four principalities. The next crusade uh, was motivated, in fact, from this point on, after the first crusade, which conquered the Holy Land and set up these principalities, everything after this either accomplished nothing or it was just in response to some defeat on the part of the crusaders that they needed to, to address. 
1147, uh, Muslims defeated the Crusader County of Edessa, the one in the far north. This is in 1144. They prompted the Second Crusade, which was mostly French and German, and it failed to accomplish anything except, again, persecuting European Jews and then <coughs> providing victory for Muslim armies. They never even got there. This was, these are the roots of all of the Crusades. And again, they were coming from all over Western Europe. I'll talk about this one, the blue one, in a minute. Um, these were the places. County of Edessa had been the first to fall, and then Antioch, Tripoli, and Jerusalem were the others. The Third Crusade, 1189-92. The Muslim armies finally were combined under Saladin. You've heard of Saladin. He's a name that, that's known. You will remember he had been the Grand Vizier of the... Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt. He felt they were completely incompetent. He finally overthrew them. He would not name himself Caliph because that's a religious title, but he made himself the head of the next dynasty, dynasty, which was the Ayyubid dynasty. He had combined all of the Muslim armies at that point, and he was very successful. Uh, they were able to retake Jerusalem in 1187, um, and that led, Jerusalem falling led to the call for the Third Crusade. This is the one that most people are aware of or have heard of if they think about the Crusades. It's sometimes called the Crusade of the Three Kings because the King of England, Richard I, who was known as Richard Lionheart, was one of them, the King of King Philip II of France, and the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa of Germany all agreed to take up the cross, to join the Crusade, to go to the Holy Land. Now, um, there were delays and delays and delays, and uh, Frederick Barbarossa got tired of waiting, the German emperor. He went, the emperor of Constantinople uh, led him across, they got into uh, Asia Minor, and then Barbarossa drowned crossing a river. And all of his knights said, we don't really want to do this anyway. So they went home. There was part of it. Uh, Philip II of France was kind of reluctant to do it, we think, and he kept delaying and delaying and delaying. So um, Richard the Lionheart traveled by boat. He thought that was the best way. And as he traveled around, this is the part of, of Spain that was still controlled by Muslims. As he went along the coast here, he liberated cities along the way from Muslim rule. He goes over, meets up with Philip. They have one victory, and Philip says, okay, I'm done. And he goes home. We then have the Fourth Crusade, and, and Lionheart fought battles. Actually, uh, Lion, uh, Richard the Lionheart and Saladin came to greatly respect each other. They were both very fair-minded, and they ended up signing a treaty that said if the Crusaders will not try to take over any more land, then Saladin said the Muslim armies will, will allow Christian uh, pilgrims to come in, and they will not try to take any more land from the Byzantines. Everybody seemed happy. But they respected so much each other in battle, there's even a story that at one point uh, in a battle, and this is back when kings actually were in the front lines battling, when King Richard was uh, battling and his horse is cut down from under him and he's on foot and he's fighting and Saladin sees him and he sends a horse to him because he said kings should not battle on foot. And so they had great respect for each other and signed this treaty and everything looked really good for a while. Then we come to the horrendous event of the Fourth Crusade. The Fourth Crusade never reached the Holy Land. What happened was, Crusaders from Western Europe went, they decided it was a good idea that Richard had, let's go by boat. So the uh, maritime power in Western Europe at that time was Venice. They were a city-state, very powerful. They approached the Doge, who's the guy in charge in Venice, and said, um, we want you to build us some boats. We're gonna have 30,000 Crusaders were going to have armies and um, horses and servants and all this stuff. And you build the boats, we'll pay you for them, and then you can take us. The Doge said, fine. So he built the boats for 30,000 people. Turns out they only ended up getting 11,000 Crusaders, and they didn't have any money. Well, the Doge said, I'm not going to just give you these boats we just built, but I'll tell you what I'll do. The Doge of Venice said, there's a city in Croatia called Zara, which is a very wealthy trading center. It used to belong to Venice, and it got taken away from them. He said, you've got all these soldiers, we've got all these boats. If you take your soldiers and horses and you recapture Zara and give it to us, 
then we're even. So they did. They conquered a Christian city, Zara in Croatia, gave it back to Venice. At this point, the Pope tell, had told the leader of this group of crusaders in the Fourth Crusade, if you do this, you're excommunicated, so is everybody else. He very conveniently didn't bother to tell any of the other guys with him that this was the case. Well, after Zara, they, they were sort of looking around saying, well, what are we going to do now? And they decide, we'll go on to Constantinople. On the way to Constantinople, on board the boats, there was a guy who, um, who had been part of the royal family of, of Constantinople. His father had been deposed and blinded, they put out his eyes, and he was in prison in, in the city of Constantinople. And so this, um, this young man told the crusaders, look, if you will go with me to Constantinople, free my father, put him back on the throne, I will give you another 20,000 soldiers to fight with you and 30,000 marks, which was the, the money of the day, a lot of money, a fortune. They said, great. So they go and attack the city of Constantinople, the Christian city of Constantinople that they were supposed to be going to defend, right? They conquer it, they depose the current emperor, they reestablish the blind emperor who had been deposed previously, and then the emperor and his son inform them they neither have any troops they can send nor do they have any money. Uh, Sound like that happened a lot. So the crusaders do what any sensible crusaders would have done at that point, and that is they sack the city. They tear it apart, take everything of value out of it, and turn it into a Western Latin city. It had been Greek, Eastern, but for a period of 56 years, Constantinople got turned into a Latin Roman Catholic city when it had been Greek Orthodox. Um, it, 50, after 56 years, that changed. There's some, the, the Muslims had something to do with that. So here you get all of these different crusades, all of them centering in Constantinople and then coming down to the Holy Land. This is a different image. Um, it's like a diagram I'm going to show you tomorrow, and you'll understand that when I tell you. The final crusades, Eastern Crusades, there was a 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th Crusade that achieved, achieved nothing. The first four were the only ones that had any impact, either positive or negative. The only thing that really was of significance in these last four crusades was that on the seventh crusade, King Louis IX of France died in North Africa uh, from disease. You're saying, what was he doing in North Africa? Well, they had decided that they could travel by ship to Cairo in Egypt. If they, if they conquered Cairo, that would be their base of operations, and from that they could then take over the rest of the Holy Land. Well, Louis IX was, is a saint. He was considered a, a, a terrifically holy man. Have you ever been to St. Louis? Named for him. If you've ever been to Mexico, the city of San Luis Potosi, named for him. He, he's a saint of the church, considered a very righteous and holy man. He died of disease in North Africa on the Seventh Crusade. In 1289, the Crusader County of Tripoli falls. Again, they had already lost Edessa. They had already lost Jerusalem. They had not been successful in retaking it. And then Tripoli falls. And in 1291, the city of Agar falls. It's the last of the Crusaders are driven from the Middle East. And so the Crusader principalities uh, in, in that part of the world are gone. But there then were a number of minor Crusades that don't even get counted in the list. There was, as I mentioned, the Peasants' Crusade. They were massacred outside Nicaea. There also were a number of northern crusades against pagans in Germany and northern Europe. I'm going to talk in just a couple of minutes about the martial orders. Knights Templar, Knights Hospitaller, there was a group called the Teutonic Knights that were German, and they were defending northern Europe against what they thought were pagan influences, trying to force them to become Christians. In 1208 to 1241, there is a crusade against the Albigensians, also known as Cathars. They were considered heretics in southern France and Bosnia, and they declared that a crusade. It was just a campaign against people they thought were heretics. In 1212, the horrendous children's crusade. A young man said he had visions from God that the Holy Land would be retaken by children. 
And he traveled across the countryside and ended up getting thousands of children to join him. And he said that he had had a vision that when they reached the coast, boats would be there to carry them to the Holy Land and they would reclaim the Holy Land. They got to the coast, no boats were there, they were all taken and sold into slavery. You see, this wasn't just fun for the people that were involved in all of this stuff. 1212 to 1492, we talk about the 10th Crusade, which is a Reconquista. You will remember from the images there that most of Spain is still controlled by the Muslims. The Reconquista is the reconquering of the Iberian Peninsula, the retaking of Spain from the Muslims. Um, and this occurred, the, the last of the Muslims left Iberia in 1492, the same year that Columbus sort of rediscovered America. There were a lot of people there before him. He didn't discover it. People were there first. But when he discovered it for Western Europe. And the interesting thing about that is when the Muslims left Western Europe, tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit about the Golden Age of Islam, when they were the epitome of science and mathematics, medicine, astronomy, everything, philosophy was Islamic. You know, back when they, when they had advanced medical techniques in Baghdad, when Western European surgeons were all barbers. Mm -hmm. And when the Islamic people left the Iberian Peninsula, they left behind their libraries at Alhambra and other places. If you've seen the beautiful, beautiful sites they left behind. And Western Europe coming out of the Dark Ages, you know, they're, they're, we're in the 1400s now, so they're well past the Dark Ages, the Scholastic Age, but they discover all of this stuff that they didn't know existed. Western Europe had lost all of the Greek philosophers. They knew nothing about Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. They knew nothing about the sciences. They did not have the writings of Hippocrates about medicine. Um, and they were still using Roman numerals in Western Europe. I mentioned this before. Challenge for you. Go back to your room, write down five Roman numerals, and try to add them up. It is not possible. And yet that's the only kind of number system they had. They, ad uh, they adapted and adopted the Arabic numerals. What we use today is still called Arabic numerals. They were reintroduced to Western Europe after the 10th Crusade and the Muslims left Iberia. The Roman numerals and the previous numbering system had no concept of zero. Can you imagine doing anything scientifically, mathematically, anything else without a concept of zero? We owe that to the Muslims that left the Iberian Peninsula. Later on, in the 16th century, the thing would come to pass that they had been afraid of, and that, this is a bad map because uh, it, you know, it looks like that there's no, no connection here, but um, the Muslim armies did actually take over Eastern Europe. They conquered all of Greece, Romania, Hungary, um, Wallachia, Moldavia, Transylvania, the countries that, are, that um, have joined now. And again, for over 100 years, they were right outside the gates of Vienna. This is exactly what they had been afraid of. But at this point, they've been driven out of the Iberian Peninsula and were still down in North Africa. Later on, there would be efforts to push them back and they, that would change. The Ottoman Empire, again, still controlled most of this in the 1600s. They got pushed back and by the time of the First World War in 1914, they had just a little bit of Eastern Europe and then Anatolia and these areas, and of course, after the First World War, because they sided with Germany and also Hungary, that was taken away from them and broken up into smaller countries. But these were the threats that they were responding to. And so, to a great extent, despite all of the atrocities, and I'm not in any way defending that, and I'm not even picking sides, but I believe that the primary motivation for the Crusades from the Western European point of view is that they saw it as a war of defense. They were fighting back from the Islamic armies who were already taken over the Iberian Peninsula and were threatening up into, into France all the time, and the threat at Constantinople for them to do that, to, to take over Eastern Europe. And they responded. They responded in horrible ways, but I think that's why they responded. A few minutes, I'll tell you about the martial orders. The Knights Templar are some folks that are, a lot of people have heard about this. There are a lot of novels written about them. Um, somebody told me just that they just finished reading a book about them here on the boat. They're the guys in white. The, the black guy is a hospitaller. But the Knights Templar wore white um, tunics, white 
capes and a red cross. They were a military order, which means they were like monks with swords. They swore a religious oath to, and they swore right uh, to poverty, chastity, and obedience, just like monks did. Except instead of growing crops or making beer or building churches, their call was to fight wars for on behalf of their faith. And that's true with all of the military orders. The Templars were very, very successful. They were extraordinary. The most ferocious, probably warriors, certainly at that time, maybe ever. Saladin, who was a very fair guy, um, who, as I say, he was known to be honorable. Whenever he would conquer an army, you know, if he won, he would usually release the prisoners. He would not allow them to be mistreated. And he might ransom some of them if they were wealthy, but he would let them go, except for Templars. They were so, uh, so her terrifically dangerous in battle that if a Templar was cap captured, even Saladin would have them killed immediately. He thought they were too dangerous to, to be allowed to live. There was one instance where um, Saladin had an army of 21,000 and 500 Templars and about 2,000 additional foot soldiers defeated his army of 21,000. They were, you know, heck on wheels when it came to fighting battles. And they did it for religious fervor. Interestingly enough, they were also very smart. They ended up, um, because they, all these guys who joined it as knights, they would give all of their money to the order. And then other people would give money to the order, or, or land, or whatever, because they thought that was an act of sacred devotion, and that they would be blessed for that. Well, over a period of time, as they accrued money, they started loaning the money, and getting more money, and more money. And they became horrendously wealthy. In fact, they became the bankers of Western Europe. And they, they invented writing checks. What happened is, if I, I told you how expensive it was, if somebody in Western Europe was going on a crusade, they could go to the local Templars, give them their money, and get a check. Travel to the Holy Land, give that check to the Templars in the Holy Land, and they would give them his money. So that they didn't have to carry cash all that distance. Well, unfortunately, that ended up leading to their demise. Because the Templars ended up loaning money to... Uh, royalty all over Western Europe and they loaned a lot of money to Philip of France and in fact they loaned so much money to Philip of France that he could no longer see any way to repay them and because of that um, he I'm looking for a specific here uh, because of that he decided the only way he was going to get out from under that debt is to get rid of the Templars so at that point he pretty much had control of the Pope Pope Clement and on October 13th, Friday, October 13th of 1307, Philip IV of France ordered the arrest of all the Templars. He got the Pope to agree by threatening the Pope. Clement was not a strong uh, leader. And on November 22nd, Pope Clement condemned them. They were accused of uh, homosexuality and, and worshiping demons and spitting on the cross and um, satanic worship, all kinds of stuff, you name it. They were tortured, a few of them, gave confessions which they later recanted because they'd given them under torture. But on March 18th of 1314, Jacques de Molay and the other leaders, do we have any Masons in the group? The Order of de Molay comes from that, comes from Jacques de, de Molay, uh, who's one of the leaders of the Knights Templar. And Jacques de Molay and the other leaders were uh, burned alive in Paris. And they tried to wipe it out. Now it still existed in places like Portugal because they were not persecuted in Portugal. but. Right before his death, Jacques de Molay said, those who are responsible for this will face a reckoning. Within one month, the Pope was dead. Before the end of the year, Philip IV of France was dead. So Jacques de Molay seemed to know what he was talking about. But they were an extraordinary group, but they were wiped out. There have been many attempts to try to reestablish the Knights Templar. There's even a group of narcotraficantes, you know, drug dealers, in Mexico. They call themselves the Knights Templar. Um, these are the Knights of St. John, or um, more appropriately, their title is the Hospitlers of St. John of Jerusalem. They began in 1113. The first thing they were doing is providing medical care and treatment to pilgrims in the Holy Land who were wounded or injured or whatever. Well, pretty soon, because a lot of that was happening because they were being attacked, they decided to start defending them, and they became a military order. Again, 
They, and they wore the black tunic with the white cross. What later became known, this was called the St. John's Cross. In 1291, they moved to Cyprus when the Crusaders were driven out of the Holy Land, and they lived on Cyprus for a while. Then in 1309, they moved to Rhodes and became known as the Knights of Rhodes. Then they were driven from Rhodes by Suleiman the Magnificent, and Suleiman had so much respect for them that after six months of siege, where 500 Knights Hospitaller were able to hold off the whole of Suleiman's significant army, he allowed them to march out of their castle with their banners flying and with their weapons at their side, mount their uh, to board their boats and sail away with no punishment because he had that much respect for them. They left, after they left Rhodes, they went to Malta, which was given to them by Charles V of Spain, and they became the Knights of Malta. If you go to Malta, or Cyprus, or Rhodes, or any of those places, you will find Crusader uh, castles, because that's where the Crusaders, many of them, went after they were driven out of the Holy Land. And finally, the Teutonic Knights, they wore the white with the Latin cross. You'll notice this is the, the Maltese cross, or the cross of St. John, which is four even. Uh, these guys, the uh, Teutonic Knights, wore a black cross on a white field, and it was the Latin cross with the longer uh, bottom. They, as I say, they fought in the Holy Land for a while, but then they moved to Western Europe. They helped defend the borders of Hungary um, when the, they were being attacked by the Muslims. They also defended Transylvania, and they fought in some of the lesser crusades against pagans in uh, Eastern Europe. They were actually outlawed by Napoleon in 1809, but they still exist as a, an honorary charitable organization. They still have ritual kinds of events, but they're not involved in anything military anymore. One of the things that they left behind were castles all over the Holy Land. This is Montford Castle in the Upper Galilee. Um, this one is Markov Castle in Syria. And this one especially is extraordinary, the Croc de Chevalier in, in Syria. Thomas um, Lawrence, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. He started out in the Middle East tra walking in order to investigate Crusader castles and the ruins they left behind. He called this the most important and beautiful castle ever built. Um, in its heyday, it could contain 2,000 knights and all of their seconds, all the men that supported them, and all of their horses and gear. Um, there are places where the walls are 100 feet thick. And so it is quite, quite the castle. Um, this is Kyrenia Castle on Cyprus, and you will see these. The islands of the Eastern Mediterranean, most of them were occupied at one time or another by the, uh, the knights, one of the, the orders of knights, and then all along the coast they have these fortifications. So reasons for the Crusades. I've already said response to the Byzantine Emperor's call for help, to defend Christian Europe against further invasion by the Muslim armies, to reunite the two halves of Christendom, to establish the authority of Pope Urban II, to defend Christian holy sites and pilgrims, to give focus for the energies of the Western Knights, the belief in the imminent second coming of Jesus, which they thought required that the Holy Land be in Christian hands, and for a very, very few, the potential for adventure and gain. Um, myths about the Crusades, that they were simply a, a result of religious prejudice and intolerance that spilled into violence, that the Crusaders did it for money. Like I say, most of them went broke doing this. The plan all along was to conquer the Holy Land and drive out all Muslims and Jews. That had not been part of the motivation. In fact, the Emperor of Constantinople and Pope Urban did not think that this was about taking the Holy Land. It was just about defending Eastern Christianity, Constantinople, from the Muslim armies. But when they got there and they started winning battles in the, in the First Crusade, they just kept going. And the next thing you know, they were in control of the Holy Land. That was not even the intention originally. The Muslims were noble in the face of Christian atrocities, or the Christians were noble in the face of Muslim atrocities. Both of them are myths. There were terrible things and noble things on both sides, and that all of Christendom was united against Muslim and Jewish people. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with armies that were trying to invade. This is what we usually think that the Crusaders were like. You know, big, strong, you know, wealthy, big horses, stallions. This is much more what they really were like. <laughs> It was a horrendous, most of the people who went on crusade and gave up everything they owned did not expect to come home, and most of them didn't. It was quite extraordinary um, that they went there not believing that they would survive it. 
So the consequences, it was a halt, at least initially, to the expanse of Islam. The 10th Crusade drove them out of the Iberian Peninsula in the west. They were held up for a while. Later on, they came back into Eastern Europe, but they were pushed back again. The final split between Eastern and Western Christianity after the Crusaders in the Fourth Crusade sacked the city of Constantinople and took it over for 56 years, there was not going to be any further conversation. It has only been in our lifetime that Eastern Orthodoxy and the Roman Catholic Church have started talking again. That's how bad the split was because of all this. The reestablishment of trade between East and West, including developments in learning and culture, they learned that there were all these extraordinary things like oranges and pomegranates and, you know, etc. Camels. Can you imagine what it was like for the first Westerner to see a camel? Um, and the trade opportunities, the adventure, the advances in education, uh, the things that we learned from uh, Islam, we being the West, a focus and clarification of European culture. That is, as opposed to being a Frenchman or an Englishman or a German, all of a sudden, because they had fought together, there was a sense of what it meant to be a European. <coughs> the launch of Western spirit of exploration, it's no coincidence that it was right after this that the age of exploration began. 1492, Columbus sails the ocean blue, the Portuguese are traveling to India. Um, all of that happened, I believe, others believe too, because of the experience of seeing all of the exotic parts of the Middle East during the Crusades and saying, well, wonder what else is out there? Let's get on a boat and go find out. The clarification of the papal authority, long-term enmity between Christianity and Islam, they still bring this up. Although, you need to know, for 500 years, the idea that there is some inherent conflict between Islam and Christianity that goes all the way back to the Crusades, between 1500 and 1900, 400 years, nobody talked about that. A war had been fought, and Western Europe was on one side, and the Muslim nations of the Middle East were on the other side, but they were, they were not constantly throwing it back in, in the other side's face and saying, yeah, but you did this to us back in the 11th, 12th century. It wasn't until the 20th century that people started suggesting that that was a problem. Prior to that, it was just a war. So this is the Crusades. Any questions? I've gone long. Yes? Who's in charge of this nonsense? I mean, mm -hmm. generals on the, uh, the Christian side. I mean, if you have 40,000 people and say, hey, let's all show up over here in battle. I mean, who's, uh, who's doing the strategy? Who's doing the, uh, the engineering? OK, who's in charge of the Crusaders? Usually it was kings. <laughs> From time to time, somebody, and it was always somebody of some royal blood. I mean, the, 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 four, uh, the four crusader states that existed, each of them had a king. Um, and there would be others that would take over. Like when Richard the Lionheart was there, he was the primary leader of the crusaders. Saladin was the primary leader of the, the Muslims. So in every case, there was someone, almost always royalty, who was in charge and deciding to go. Now, the times that they that it really folded in on itself, like the Fourth Crusade where they ended up sacking Constantinople, uh, was when they did not have strong leadership. When it was a little bit more, hey guys, let's go, you know, um, so, but there were royals. I mean, there were royal families like Richard Reinhardt, oh II of France, and uh, Frederick Barbarossa leading these things. <laughs>